8.30 p.m. Good evening, I'm Chu Wee Lin on News 5 Tonight. Those who cancel their HDB flat bookings will be penalised further. It definitely makes the applicants think more carefully. The government explains why it's extending the employment period for unskilled foreign workers. We have already contributed a lot to the Hong Kong family, economy and society. But Hong Kong's High Court overturns a ruling giving foreign maids the right to apply for permanent residency. And Apple offers customers in Australia a refund for the new iPad. The Housing and Development Board has tweaked its rules to improve the chances of serious home buyers. Those who cancel their flat bookings will now face tougher penalties. And the income ceiling for two-room flats in mature estates has been raised to $5,000. A bumper crop of new flats released, attracting a steady crowd hoping to get the pick of their choice. Half of the 8,000 flats are in built-to-order projects. The others are completed or near-completed flats spread across 26 estates. With continued strong interest, the HDB has tightened rules to ensure that flats are allocated only to serious buyers. Those who cancel their flat bookings will now be barred for a year from applying for another new flat. This includes flats sold under the Design, Build and Sell Scheme, resale flats with housing grants and executive condominiums. The new rule is on top of existing measures. Home buyers who cancel their bookings lose the booking fee and 10% down payment. Property watchers say only a small number of people cancel their bookings and the new rule is unlikely to have a significant impact on the number of applications. However, such a measure is aimed at sending a strong signal that booking a flat is a serious commitment. What it's going to do is that it definitely, first and foremost, will make the applicants think caref more carefully okay, before they commit to buy a BTO because they know the consequence. Another policy tweak, the income ceiling for two-room flats in mature estates has been raised from $2,000 to $5,000. The HDB says this is to provide an additional housing option for those who prefer to live in mature estates. It adds that the income ceiling for flats in non-mature estates will remain to keep such flats for low-income families. Property watchers say the new measure will appeal to small families who are looking for specific locations. The two-room at Budok will be about $174,000 and that restricting for income below $2,000 may not be actually affordable or it may be a bit of a stretch. So allowing this increment is to giving more options to people with slightly higher income. At the end of the day, the choice is still up to the client because for the same price of a two room in a mature estate, one could always buy a three room in the non-mature estates. The HDB says the bumper crop of flats is aimed at meeting diverse needs. While there will be continued priority given to first-timers, new schemes introduced in Parliament earlier this month have also improved the chances for other buyers. Minister of State for Manpower and National Development Han Chuan Jin says the move to increase the maximum employment period of unskilled foreign workers is not meant to ease Singapore's labour crunch. He says the extension makes more effective use of labour within the time period allotted. On Monday, the Manpower Ministry said from the 1st of July, unskilled work permit holders from non-traditional sources can be employed up to 10 years, up from the current six years. Many companies have been asking for an extension to the period of employment of unskilled foreign workers. Importantly as well, they've been here a while, they've become socialised to the norms. So that is also important, uh, not so much in terms of assimilation, but in terms of uh, adjusting to the society here, as opposed to, say, bringing in another, another new worker. Earlier during a visit to Calibre Link, Mr Tan launched several initiatives from the Workforce Development Agency targeted at professionals, managers and executives. WDA has also revamped its website. Now one feature is this job profiler that helps determine the occupations that best fit job seekers. I need to choose three personality traits in order of priority. And these are the jobs that may suit me. 
our approach will be uh, individualized to um, each professional depending on what their needs and interests are. Some 400 PMEs have benefited from Calibaling services since it was launched last December. A Hong Kong court has overturned last September's landmark ruling which granted foreign domestic helpers the right to apply for permanent residency. The government's victory is a major blow for hundreds of thousands of foreign maids working in the city. The heated battle over foreign domestic helpers' rights to permanent Hong Kong residency took a turn in favor of the government. In a written judgment, a panel of three judges unanimously overturned a lower court's ruling, which deemed the city's immigration law excluding some 290,000 foreign domestic helpers from applying unconstitutional. The landmark ruling in September resulted from a judicial review launched by domestic helper Evangeline Banal Vallejos. Foreign domestic helpers who have been closely following this case were disappointed with the ruling. We do not want to be discriminated in the law, in the policy, even in the practice. Uh, since we are actually one of the biggest migrants community here, we have already contributed a lot to the Hong Kong family, economy and society. And I think the decision today shows that even the court legitimized discrimination against foreign domestic helper in Hong Kong. Under Hong Kong's basic law, a foreigner can gain permanent residency after living continuously in the territory for seven years. But the city's immigration law states foreign domestic helpers are not considered to be ordinarily resident. In its appeal, the government rejected arguments the restrictions were discriminatory, saying Hong Kong authorities had the discretionary power to decide who was eligible for residency. In accepting the appeal, High Court Chief Judge Andrew Chern wrote, it is a fundamental principle in international law that a sovereign state has the power to admit, exclude and expel aliens. The Hong Kong government had stopped the processing of right of abode applications by foreign domestic helpers in light of the appeal. The government welcomes the judgment of the Court of Appeal. After consideration, the government decides to maintain a position to withhold processing the right of abode applications submitted by foreign domestic helpers. We believe that the judicial review applicant will likely apply for, for leave to appeal against the court of appealed judgment. Meanwhile, the lawyers for the domestic helper who launched the original case said the court's interpretation of the law creates a second-class citizen. They said they plan to take their case to Hong Kong's highest court. Leslie Tang, Chow News Asia, Hong Kong. JetBlue 191 emergency and we're going to need... Uh, authorities and uh, medical to meet us at the airplane. We'll get it in position. We have medical and security personnel. Well, that was the co-pilot of a JetBlue flight requesting assistance at Amarillo, Texas. The plane from New York had to make an emergency landing after the captain marched through the cabin ranting about Al-Qaeda and bomb threats. The co-pilot had already locked him out of the cockpit, sensing something was wrong earlier. This video posted on YouTube shows passengers helping to tackle and subdue the pilot, who cannot be seen here, until the plane landed. The FBI is investigating the incident. Apple is offering to refund Australian customers who felt misled about the 4G capabilities of the new iPad. Australia's consumer watchdog took Apple to court for false advertising because the tablet computer does not work on the country's 4G network. It insists Apple put corrective stickers on iPad boxes. However, Apple's lawyer says the company is not prepared to apply the stickers. But he adds that Apple will email customers to clarify that the device is not compatible with local carrier Telstra's 4G network, even though the company had never said that the new iPad is compatible with its network. Apple's problems in Australia could have a wider impact on markets, where the company also advertises the new iPad as featuring 4G, despite those countries having an incompatible network or no 4G networks yet. Coming up on News 5, experts are worried about the high rate of stroke patients dropping out of supervised therapy here. But it seems some patients have no choice. We rather invest much more efforts to help our charities to stay out of trouble than to spend resources getting them out of trouble. A new initiative is unveiled to encourage good governance in the charity sector. with news
5 tonight. Health Minister Gan Kim Yong says focusing on cost effectiveness and not cost per se has enabled Singapore to achieve good health outcomes at a low cost. He adds that focusing on holistic care will help Singapore face health care challenges. An aging population requires more frequent care and this care should, where possible, be delivered in the community instead of in the acute hospitals. We have therefore enhanced our financing system, such as increasing subsidies for long-term care, increased assistance for drug costs for the lower and middle income, and enhancing portable subsidies for primary care. Mr Gunn was sharing Singapore's approach to health care challenges at a conference this morning. Besides being cost efficient, he said Singapore has benefited from integrated care for patients. This means public hospitals collaborating with nursing homes and community hospitals to allow patients to move seamlessly across care settings. And to ensure health care remains affordable, Mr. Gan said the government must be judicious in deciding what to subsidize. Experts in Singapore are worried about the high rate of stroke patients who drop out of supervised therapy after they've been discharged from hospital. Doctors at the National University of Singapore say those who don't continue with therapy greatly reduce their ability to perform daily activities. In Singapore, there are more than 10,000 new stroke patients every year. Of these, more than 60% become moderately or severely disabled three months after an attack. But a study conducted on more than 200 patients from Taihokon Hospital and St. Luke's Hospital showed that only a third continue with supervised therapy after they're discharged. While this is comparable to that of the United States and way above that in Australia, experts fear that the number of immobile stroke patients will increase with time. And it's not just the rehabilitation that you're doing at home that's important. What's fundamental is that you actually go back to the day rehab centre to see your therapist so that he can actually supervise your rehabilitation. A key reason why stroke patients do not continue with therapy even after discharge is because of the high financial burden. On average, a day rehabilitation session costs about $40. And experts recommend that the patients go for it twice a week. So this comes up to about $320 a month. Other reasons include the lack of caregivers who can accompany the patients. Doctors urge the government to look into ways to help these patients. Stroke is the fifth leading cause of death in Singapore. Acting Minister for Community Development, Youth and Sports, Chan Chun Singh, says governance standards of charities must remain high and inspire confidence for others to join the sector. And to give the extra push to charities, Mr Chan announced the first of its kind Charity Governance Awards today. There are about 2,000 charities in Singapore currently, and while the sector has been rocked by scandals involving corporate governance, such as the one involving the National Kidney Foundation in 2005, the latest statistics indicate public confidence in the sector has picked up. And as stakeholders gathered to share best practices, they were reminded to continue their efforts to raise the standard of good governance. We rather invest much more efforts to help our charities to stay out of trouble than to spend resources getting them out of trouble. One new effort is the Charity Governance Awards, which seek to recognise those that walk the talk. It will help others you know, to learn from them and also embrace you know, good governance practices. It will also help to uh, promote self-regulation, okay, uh, greater uh, public confidence, and also promote you know, greater awareness in terms of uh, the progress and improvements that charities have made. That word is clarity. Church Community Services welcomes the move by the Charity Council and says clarity in operations forms the basis of its good governance. The positive thing about these awards will be that it will definitely be a benchmark for the industry to, to, to aim itself to get to. Among others, winners can stand to win a cash award to further their charitable cause. Well, the council is still working on the number of categories and the cash award to be handed out, but it's understood that more details will be released next month and the awards be given out in the fourth quarter of this year. And still to come on five, the latest from the World Team Table Tennis Championships in Germany, where defending women's champions Singapore are playing their last round of group games today.
And just how gracious are Singaporeans? The results after the break. Business news, the Singapore Exchange says it's reorganizing its business structure to better leverage growth opportunities in Asia. Starting in May, it will have five business units, namely derivatives, listings, market data and access, post-trade and securities. The shake-up follows the resignation of co-president Gan Xiao An, who's leaving after 11 years with the company. He will stay on as an advisor. Three companies have been conferred the Distinguished Partner in Progress Award. They include Keppel Offshore and Marine and Semcorp Marine. This is the first time that homegrown companies have won the award since it was introduced in 1991. Procter & Gamble also received the award. Deputy Prime Minister Teo Chi Hien says these companies have created good jobs for Singaporeans through their investments and business activities and also actively contributed to the Singapore community. And here are the market numbers. Football and the Champions League now. Spanish giants Real Madrid and English side Chelsea have taken a big step towards the semi-finals after away wins in the first leg of their quarter-final ties. Nine-time champions Real produced a late flurry of goals to beat this season's surprise packages Apoel Nicosia 3-1 in Cyprus. Karim Benzema struck twice in the 74th and 90th minutes. Substitute Kaka was also on target. The second leg will be played next week in Madrid. In Lisbon, Salomon Kalu scored the only goal of the game to give Chelsea a valuable 1-0 win at Benfica. The victory puts the Blues in a strong position ahead of next week's second leg. And on to the World Team Table Tennis Championships in Germany. Teams are playing their last round of group games today ahead of the start of the knockout stages tomorrow. Defending women's champions Singapore have beaten the Netherlands 3-1 in Group B. But it was the European champions who struck first. Li Jiao came from two games down to beat Singapore's number one, Feng Tianwei. Wang Yuegu made it one all for Singapore by beating Li Tie in five grueling games. Oli Jiawei then made it 2-1 to Singapore, quickly dispatching Linda Kremers. Feng then came back to make amends for her earlier loss, beating Li Jie for Singapore's winning point. High reporter Jeffrey Lip joins us from Dortmund with the latest in what's happening at the tournament. Now Jeffrey, what do the results mean for the Singapore women's team? Hi, Rulin. It is a huge boost for Singapore. I mean, when Feng Tianwei lost the first match, it was a sign that the Dutch would be the toughest opponents that Singapore have met so far. And make no mistake, this was a big hurdle for Singapore's women, and they performed really well in, in a tie that was just pure quality. And, and um, I mean, speaking of quality, I mean, we, we have to say that uh, Wang Yegu was simply exceptional in her match against uh, Li Jie. Um, but the other positive, and speaking of Wang, is, is that the, uh, the team has improved its discipline. Now, Feng Tianwei was given a red card in her first match, but uh, this one was, meant, a spoint, uh, meant a points deduction in her, uh, for her. But the team had agreed yesterday not to react adversely to these kind of things anymore. Now, the win means Singapore is just about to go through to the next round and should top their group and get that bye to the quarterfinals, barring a major upset against Sweden in their next tie, which should start in um, under 10 minutes. All right, thanks, thanks, thanks very much for that update, Jeffrey. That was Jeffrey Lip reporting from Dortmund, Germany. Now, according to the Singapore Kindness Movement's 2012 Graciousness Index, behavior on the road and on public transport continues to bug Singaporeans, while young people under the age of 30 appear to have become more gracious. 1,400 residents took part in the survey. One of their biggest grouses, passengers on public transport should make a greater effort to make space for incoming passengers, say 53% of respondents. It's not that people do not want to be kind at certain times, it's just that um, we are forced to do some things in a way that relates to unkindness in a way, but 
is not what we want. It's maybe easier to give money to a charity or to do big movements or to set aside a day to bless somebody. But I think the things that like the day-to-day, -day, the driving, the public transport, that's a habit, you know, and so that takes time to create a habit to truly grow. 66% of the respondents surveyed were happy with the way respect is shown for other religions and races. This year's survey also found that youths under the age of 30 have shown a marked improvement in graciousness. It showed that they are now more sensitive to gracious behaviour than adults aged between 30 and 50. Baby boomers aged above 60 still scored the highest overall. The educational level of our young people, the exposure uh, to you know, different people, uh, the uh, opportunities for travel and so on, I think that's also probably uh, influence uh, the way they look at uh, life. Graciousness at the end of the day is being aware of people around you. This year, Singaporeans scored 61 on the Graciousness Index compared to 60 last year. And that's News 5 tonight. Good night.